Welcome to Unapologetically Sensitive, where you can learn, relate, laugh, and maybe even live a bolder, brighter life. I'm your host, Patricia Young. This is a weekly podcast where we explore the strengths we have because of our sensitivity and some of the challenges it poses as well. The information in this podcast is not a substitute for help from a licensed mental health professional. Hey there. To the creatives, healers, sensitives, and deep thinkers, how the heck are you doing? We are, by the time you hear this, I record pretty far ahead of time, so I'm always curious. Oh, so we're just getting ready for Turkey Day. See if you're in Canada, if you had Turkey Day yet. Anyways, let me jump in and tell you about this episode, and I want to give you a little bit of a heads up. If you listen to episode 161, which is called Responding When Someone Has Been Hurtful with Jen, this is a follow-up. It just happened today, so it's, it's very, very fresh. I'm going to be playing a recording. What I want you to know is everything is fine. I'm fine. It all worked out. I don't want anybody to get traumatized. I cry in a little bit of this episode. I sent Melvin a text a couple days ago, and he responded, and it, I was very surprised. And I just went and sat down and did some recording. I read the text that I sent him. I read what he sent me back. I talk about my feelings about it. And then Jen and I get on and record today, a few days later after I was with Melvin and Melvin told this whole group of people everything that went on. <laughs> and it's very interesting. It all turns out okay, I'm okay. But it's been very emotional. I wanna talk to you about what my intention is in sharing this recording with you. Because to be honest with you, this is messy, raw, imperfect stuff. I often go back and listen to episodes. These episodes I generally don't listen back to because it's painful and it's uncomfortable. It touches on the trauma. I do talk about trauma, my trauma responses. I, I think you'll find it very enlightening. I think it's incredibly, incredibly vulnerable and transparent. But my intention, and Jenna and I talked about this, I want you to feel seen, heard, validated if you have trauma, trauma responses. I was in a trauma response for weeks and didn't recognize it. And Jen and I talk about this and she didn't recognize it either. And then it happened again today. And I talk about what that looked like. And I had no idea it was happening in the moment. I want you to know that you have a voice. I want you to know that when hard things happen, there are things that you can do to take care of yourself. And I talk about them in this episode. I talk about the things that I am affirming to myself. I want you to have hope. I want you to feel like you're not alone. I want you to, to have a glimpse at something that most people don't get a chance to see. I'm a therapist. Theoretically, as Melvin said, <laughs> I should be more sensitive. I'm a human being. And I'm allowing you into seeing this messy, imperfect process. You know, I cry when I'm angry. It makes me mad if you feel disempowered. My hope is that you see yourself in my story, that you feel validated. You hear how trauma shows up. You learn how you can get support. You learn how you can have fear and discomfort and check in on what you can do with it. My hope is that you feel very connected in hearing this. If you're wondering if you're going to get activated, if you listen to 161, you don't want to. I'm just letting you know. I, I do jump on and record right after I get this text. There's redundancy, I'm sure, even in this, it's still very close and I don't have the perspective, but I think it's an incredibly powerful, helpful, hopeful, transparent episode for you. And I just wanna say that I happen to get a response on episode 159 called Unrealistic Expectations on my YouTube channel. Stephen left a message just today as I was between recording and he said, please don't, Stop sharing your stories. They're the main reason I enjoy listening. So I don't know if it's Stephen or Stefan. They're the main reason I enjoy listening so much. Personally, I don't need more facts. I need more stories. My facts are defined by the stories I place them in. And hearing you do this is a gift. So Stephen, Stefan, thank you very much. It affirms that why I do the stuff that I do. I want you to know that there's nothing wrong with you, that we all struggle, that we're imperfect and we can go through this messy, complicated life. And I'll tell you, as hard as this has been, I felt really grounded, connected, supported, loved. Anyways, that's all I have to say about this. So now, on to the show. Hey there. Whew, heavy sigh. 
I don't know if this is going to be a bonus episode or if Jen and I are going to talk about this, but I just wanted to sit down and record right now in the moment. I'm pretty darn upset. I have been sitting with this stuff with Melvin for weeks now and really trying to decide what to do. And I decided I, I really needed to say something and I'm so grateful for a handful of my friends who have really been behind me. So I sent a text this morning. So my response was, I did not tell anyone without me saying anything. A few people have mentioned your, whatever the situation is. I know I am not the only one you told. I'm not okay with you weaponizing my being a therapist and expecting that you would have the privilege of confidentiality without asking for it, even though I didn't tell anyone. What you said was shaming. I'm also not okay with you telling me how I would react, dictating that I could not process it with you, then also mandating that it stay between us. Secrets are toxic. You don't get to control the narrative. This may be what you expect from other women, but this does not fly with me. At this point, I can't be cordial to you. I won't be unkind, but how you treated me is unacceptable. So I sent a message this morning and really hoped I wouldn't get a response and let it go. I did reach out to a couple of friends. I wrote the text a day or two ago. I had a couple of people check it for me to make sure that it was okay. And then I got this message back probably five minutes ago. And what's interesting is I'm angry and I want to cry. And I know that this is relatable to so many of you. And I don't understand. I don't understand what the tears are. And I know that it's just releasing energy. I never tell any of my clients it's not okay to cry. But I'm mad. And the fact that I'm crying is what's making me angry. And I know I often cry when I'm angry. And it just makes me mad. So the response that I got was, wow, that's a lot of victiming. Let me establish an absolutely indisputable fact, one that I can know for certain. You were the first and only person in the world that I let know about this situation. And he kind of goes in to say, you know, do you remember the day that you asked me about it? And he says something about, I, I, I want to keep this information anonymous. This was the first time that you heard about this situation. It was the first time that anybody had heard about it because the people that are in this circle that we're in have had the good sense to not ask me details that I wasn't willingly offering. So now he's blaming me, <laughs> but I'm the victim here. Then he says, somebody mentioned this situation to him and then he realized that this is something that he has to deal with. And thanks to me, this wasn't the end of the world. It was just an annoyance. Then he says, when I confronted you about it, I let you know in advance of your hand-wringing response that I wouldn't be dealing with your personal feelings, all of the ridiculous, overwrought drivel that you are serving up today. You apologized at that moment and you said, I'm sorry, you owned it, you did not say you're mistaken, I didn't tell anybody. More than a month has passed. Funny how you and I are both hearing about from other people about this situation. That's how salacious news travels, a lot of round trips. I treated you in a way that was unacceptable. I came to you one-on-one -on -one to preserve your dignity and to confront an issue head on. I vowed to you that I had not let anyone else know about this situation. You thanked me for coming to you as I did. How well should a grown person address a perceived slight? I don't even care what kind of poison is circulating in your head to cause this 180. You, quote, can't be cordial to me, question mark. Thanks for putting it all in writing. You will no longer be enjoying the privilege of my silence. And then he says, I look forward to seeing you. <laughs> Oof. So that's a pretty heavy-handed, toxic, blaming, shaming response after calling me a victim and then doing that hand-wringing stuff. I honestly don't even know what to say. I, I don't even know how to process it. What I'm very clear about is, so, okay, so here's how as an HSP I can go into that. Well, I didn't tell him that I was having a fawn response and I wanted to keep this as brief and succinct as possible. And so that part of me that has empathy wants to go in and explain why I had that fawn response. You're right, I'm sorry, I didn't do it. 
but I, I don't have to process with him. I don't have to justify any of this. I don't have to do any explaining. And I think that his response clearly, clearly <laughs> shows a lot of defensiveness and anger and blaming. And I don't think at this point it's even worth engaging. It was, it was such a toxic, toxic response. And there is that part of me that's going, well, maybe I should have let him know that I had a fawn response, but he doesn't get the privilege of that. And I think his response is just indicative of the type of person that he is, the way that he communicates, his lack of curiosity, his lack of compassion, and how much blaming and shaming is in there. <sighs> I don't know that I have anything else to say right now, but I did want to just take this time to sit down because I'm just kind of reeling from this. And I'm wondering if part of the tears, you know, what I talked about in episode 161 with Jen is that young part of me that just felt like I wanted people all with me when I confronted him. And for those of you that have been here with me and just really supporting me, I appreciate it. My goal in communicating to him was so that I had a voice and I'm not going to be silenced anymore. And it's very clear that there is not two-way, empathic, understanding, compassionate communication. The way he responded was angry, toxic, vile, blaming, shaming. And so, again, I really have an opportunity to stand very clear in my truth that I know what is right for me. I know what is true for me. He doesn't have to know it. He doesn't have to see it. He doesn't have to believe it. I get to know what my truth is, and I'm not okay with people talking to me the way that he did. He can have his own reality. He can do whatever he wants. And this is really an opportunity for me to shore up what I know is true for me and the people that are with me and stand with me and behind me and for me. <sighs> And I'm uncomfortable, but I've been uncomfortable. I was uncomfortable every time I thought about this situation. And what Jen and I talked about is we often want to sit with the familiar discomfort because at least we have control over it. And now I'm <laughs> feeling a lot of feelings right here. And I'm really hoping that I will not let this toxic, toxic man take up too much space in my head because he does not deserve it. And I have so many loving, kind, supportive, powerful people in my life that are right here for me. And it's just going to be a work in progress. So that's where I'm at right now. Hey, Jen, how are you? Hey, Patricia. I'm okay. How yeah. are you? <laughs> it's been rough. <laughs> Yeah, And it's been really healing. Even though it's been hard, it's been really, really healing. Mm, beautiful. Yeah. So should we just yeah. jump in and do it? Let's just jump in. Okay. So today was the first time that I saw Melvin. It's very interesting, though, that as you and I have been talking and I've been getting support from people, I decided that I wasn't feeling safe being alone with Melvin, that I saw a side that just felt a little threatening to me. And I, I just did not want to experience or expose myself to that. And I, I did end up blocking his number because it just felt like his reaction to my text was, I, I don't want to be talked to that way. I don't want to be treated that way. And in going back into this group, I've kind of been absent for a little while. I decided that what I wanted was to talked to a handful of people in the group. And so I called them yesterday and what I said, and I was very tearful. And it's like, I started to cry. And I just said, I cry over things and I just couldn't control it. But I said, I don't want to create any drama in this kind of consortium of people that we're in. But I also need to do something so that I feel safe. And I said, I had this interaction with Melvin. It didn't go very well. I'm not feeling comfortable being alone with him. And so what I'm probably going to do is make sure that I'm paired up or sidled up with somebody else when we're together, because that's just what I need to feel safe and comfortable. And with some of the people, I did talk a little bit about how I have some trauma and there's some trauma going on for me and I just want support. And everybody was incredibly, incredibly supportive. And I felt so touched after talking to each person who said, we really missed having you. We don't want you to leave 
this little community that we have. We value you. And it just was so healing. And what I did share with one of the people was, and what this whole process is about is finding my voice and showing up in the spaces that I have. I have a right to show up and, and have these spaces. And I think that the narrative that most of us have, and I've, I've experienced some of this, if I shouldn't have said something, it just would have been easier. I'm just going to leave this group of people that it's just easier to do that. And I don't want to do that anymore. I've, some of the affirmations that I've been saying is I have a right to be here. I have a right to take up space. I have a right to be treated with respect and kindness. I have a right to have a voice. I have a right to do the things that bring me joy. And I have a right to ask for and get support. And so I think changing this narrative, and I think I've really had a sense of what survivors of domestic violence experience when they're able to take their power back. And, and I realized too, you know, Jenny and I've talked about, so we record generally four to six weeks in advance. So by the time you hear this, it's kind of old news. But the last probably four to six weeks have been feeling very blah. I haven't wanted to paddle. I've not been doing creative things. I've talked to you about like, am I depressed? And it's like, I don't think so because I get up every morning and I'm taking a shower and I'm making my bed and I'm eating okay and I'm connecting with people. But my energy has been incredibly low. And it wasn't until yesterday morning, I've been going to water fitness. Yesterday morning, when I was in water fitness and I decided I was going to reach out and get support, I felt this shift, an energetic shift in my body. And I thought, oh my gosh, I have been in a trauma response since this whole thing happened. And I had no idea that that's what was going on. And I don't know if any of you can relate to this, but that feeling of like, Ugh, blah, and then I just have had more energy. I've been doing creative projects, just something shifted. So this is how trauma shows up for us. Today, I went back into this consortium of folks and stuck very, I got there early and asked for hugs from two of the people that I spoke with yesterday and reminded myself that I'm okay. I'm safe. I've got this. I thought if he comes up to me, I'm going to say, you know, you can't do this. I'm not doing this. And the first part of how we spend time together is unstructured. And so this was much easier. The second part of how we spend time together is more formal. And we were all together in a group. And I thought maybe his reactivity is something that he you know, I'm special enough that he shared that with me in private, but it's so different than how his normal persona is that I don't think he's going to show that in the group. And I kind of sighed a little bit of, of relief. And I actually was hoping he was there because this tension and anticipation, I thought if he's not there this time, I'm going to have to wait and kind of go through all this the next time. So I was relieved that he was there in, in an odd way. And then I'm just getting ready to leave. <laughs> and he says, there's something going on. So basically, he told the group verbatim, detail by detail from the very beginning all the way through, including reading my text and his text to the group. And <laughs> this morning, I was really aware of like what's going on in my body. My chest was tight. I had butterflies in my stomach. And then when I knew he was going to do this, like I started to use like kind of my hand on my fingers to soothe myself. I was doing some deep breathing. Like I just wanted to stay grounded and present. And I knew that I didn't want to over explain that this was not my drama. And part of this thing is he's accusing me of sharing personal information with the group that he's heard from other people. And I said to the group, I really don't think that I've shared this information. And if I have told this to any of you, please tell me right now, because if I did, I will apologize. And it's so interesting because I think that Melvin's focus was more on the fact that I apologized and then he woke up to this text from me setting some limits. And I think that that activated something in him because his response was, it felt incredibly inflammatory and a little bit, a little bit menacing. There was a, a little bit of a veiled threat in there. And what's interesting is there was silence for a while. And then he said to one of the people, you are the one that sh shared this information. And this person said, I got it from somebody else who's kind of peripheral to the group, but not part of the group. And then somebody else also said, I got information from that person too. So it totally absolved me. Mm. So here's what's interesting. <laughs> Melvin continued to focus on me and it, you know, I'm absolved, and so you would think that now it's all over and resolved, right? That That's kind of the logical thing. 
but it wasn't. He still continued to focus on that I had apologized, and then I said all these things. And I was thinking today that when he had approached me, I said, this is six weeks ago, am I in trouble? And he said, kind of. And in retrospect, like, okay, there's trauma right there. There's trauma yes. right there. Yeah. And I think the people in the group, it's not a therapeutic group. They're not people that talk about feelings. So I think nobody knew what to do. And so they kind of focused on the content of what was shared and trying to normalize that. Nobody said anything about my part in it. I did say, like, I'm not going to get into this with you. And it's interesting that he left out some of the things that he said in his in from, you know, his texts back to me that were harsh and a little menacing. He neglected mm. to share those. And I wasn't aware of that in the moment. So the full story wasn't let out. And then I sat for a few minutes and then I said, okay, I, you know, I need to go. And I, again, here's where trauma comes up. And he kept saying, I don't understand what trauma has to do with this. And, you know, I tried to explain. And I said, if I could have done it any differently, I would have. It's taken me this long to figure out what was going on and this is the best that I could do. But he just really seemed focused on the injustices that he feels and the inconsistencies. So as an HSP, it would be very easy for me to go back and, well, maybe I should have handled, maybe I should have told him earlier, maybe I should have explained that I was having a trauma response. And I don't owe him any of that. But as soon as I got up to walk away, the tears came. And as soon as I got to my car, I was sobbing. Again, trauma. And I had no idea in the moment. I was kind of, again, in that, you know, like, hold it together, just stay calm, respond. And I got in my car and I sobbed and I called a friend. I knew you weren't free, Jen. So I called a friend and I had to pull over and just cry my eyes out and talk it through. But what I'm really grateful for is I'm glad that it came to a head. I'm glad that it came out. I'm glad that I reached out to people yesterday and asked for the support that I need. And my hope is that if the issue was me sharing information and breaking his confidence, and that was cleared up today, that should have cleared everything. And I don't think that it did in his mind. And it's funny that in my text, I said, you know, I can't be cordial to you, but I will be kind. But when he read my text, he kind of left out the part of I will be kind. And, you know, there was too much going on for me to be able to say anything. I will say that two of the people have reached out to me since I left and said, I know you're having a hard time. I hope you'll continue to meet with us. So I think I want to let, I think I want to let you talk, Jen. Oh, oh dear. I just really want to do a good job holding space for you in all of this. You know, this, I admire your willingness to share it. I know your passion and your mission for doing so is to invite us as HSPs to take up space, to claim our right to be here. I think it's so important to push the narrative, your narrative, your experience, something that I think most of us as HSPs, if not all of us as HSPs experience is this early gaslighting. Mm -hmm. No, it's not that way. No, it's not that way. This is the way it is. And I view this through like a narrative lens, right? That you know, in this case, Melvin's, I think the reason why he's so stuck or one of the reasons may be that, okay, that undermines my narrative a little bit, but this is the rest of the narrative that I can reclaim or that I'm going to continue to push forward. And to me, it just makes me so, so sad that the paradigm is kind of like who's right and who's wrong mm -hmm. in his eyes instead of, I think you had tried to give an invitation for what would have been something far more restorative, right? Or connective or a place to come to an understanding, right? Instead, it was met with this, well, here's all the reasons why you're wrong. You were inconsistent. And I'm just curious how many of our relationships have sort of devolved into this trial kind of thing. Like, mm -hmm. yeah, you had a trauma response and Part of a trauma response is that kind of keeping yourself safe mm -hmm. in the face of a threat. And, you know, we have fight, we have flight, we have freeze. And then as human beings, we have fib or fabricate. <laughs> and we also have fawn, mm -hmm. which is a very 
adaptive and wise thing to do when we're frightened in the moment. Now, automatic, you don't like mm-hmm. dial that up. You didn't do this on purpose. Mm-mm. And we have the right to come back and be like, hey, I thought about this. And to be like, no, that's not what you said initially. Like, it's just no, that's. Mm. <sighs> so those are some thoughts that I'm having. And I also just want to speak to how much we can be having a trauma response and not realize it. Mm-hmm. I, I mean, I watched to... it happen this morning. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yes. And I think that just point, I love that about us. That points, I think, to our mystery as human beings that we don't, we are mysterious. We, there's a lot we don't know about ourselves and we can miss that. Even the people that are the most doing their inner work, like we are still a mystery. Yeah. Yep. And that things, these things absolutely can happen yep. outside of our awareness and that that's very normal. Yeah. And it's interesting, my MO is to hide when I have to cry. And I thought later on, like, why didn't I just let myself sob as I walked away? Why didn't I allow myself to sob and let my shoulders heave and allow people to hear that? Because that was real. But so much of what I've learned is to hide my tears, hide my crying. Part of it is protective, but, you know, it's just what goes on. Yeah, well, if you could imagine points in childhood where you were encouraged to cry, where your tears were celebrated or accepted or just, it would be different, right? Yeah. Like you wouldn't, it's so funny. Like, yeah, of course. Yeah. I was told if I had to cry, I could go to my room. Yeah. So. Yeah. So th- what did you do? You went to the room, is your car, right? Yeah. I, I mean, I'm glad that you gave yourself the space to cry. Yeah. I know that you and I have had those moments of crying in front of each other. Mm-hmm comes up for me often unless I really feel very safe is that I start to feel humiliated mm. that I'm crying. That's a conditioned response from somewhere. Yep. I don't do it on purpose. Yeah. not like dial up the feeling humiliated to accompany the tears because that's so helpful. Well, and when this happened and I was angry and I was crying, like it made me mad because I knew I was angry. Like I'm not sad, I'm angry. But the way that anger comes out for me in these kinds of situations is with tears. Yeah, and I don't think you're alone in that. Yeah. I think, you know, the reason is that we try to oversimplify everything and anger looks this way and yeah. sadness is, well, that's where the tears belong. Yeah. But no, tears often come out in a wide array of emotions. Yeah. As we're talking, there's this part of me that's like, oh, I don't really want to release this episode. It feels messy and yucky. And I know other episodes that I've released that when I'm going through stuff, I rarely will listen back to them because it's activating for me. And before you and I hit record, I went over my intentions, what my intentions were for sharing this with you, the listener, because I I know, I know, I know, I know that I am not alone and this is not what you get an opportunity to get an inside peek at as somebody's going through something that's painful and difficult. And my hope is that there is not only a sense of validation and understanding and normalizing, but a tremendous sense of hope about what is possible and how we can take back our power. What I had to remind myself as I was driving to this event today is the goal is for me to have my voice, to make myself safe and to have my voice and to let go of whatever the outcome is and to just stay focused on that. And I did that. And I'm glad that it's out in the open. I'm glad that it's the dust is going to settle. And we can do hard things. I want to be able to show up in spaces and claim my space back. And how many of us have left people, activities, groups, organizations, because there was conflict and it was so uncomfortable being there, or we felt intimidated. And I, I really do think that there are people that just do not have the empathy or the understanding about what it's like to be a female who's felt threatened, who's felt intimidated. I just think that there's a real lack of that understanding. And if you are someone who has experienced trauma, whatever kind of trauma, I've just been kind of a raw nerve. I've been blessed to mostly be surrounded with people who are just showering me with love and support. So I've really had that sense of community. I've also been a little raw and I, I made the mistake last night. My son called while he was driving home from work and I shared this with him and I, I should have known better that he's young. He hasn't had trauma. I haven't talked to him about my trauma and he kind of glossed over it. And then I went back and said, I, 
I had some feelings about that and we kind of got into it. And the bottom line was I said, I just wanted some empathy, even if you don't understand I just wanted some empathy, which again, may have been too big of an ask. Like I'm not using this as a stellar example, but what I am sharing is because the people in my life around me have been so supportive, I just assumed, I made that assumption, like everybody's gonna be on board and he's not, but I could tell he was starting to wanna explain what his perspective was. And I stopped him and said, if you're gonna try and rationalize, justify, explain, I can't hear that right now. I think that we make that mistake that we get a therapist or a coach or one friend who understands us and then we go and tell somebody else and they don't get it. And that can be re-traumatizing because working through trauma is, in, it's really challenging work. And I think it puts us in such a sensitive, fragile, I don't mean fragile, weak, like vulnerable, vulnerable place where we need to protect ourselves around who are we sharing information with. Yeah, absolutely. I'm so glad you were able to have that boundary. I mean, I think that to be able to space it out, I'm going to tell you something that I'm going through. Maybe this is also why I love Marco Polo so Mm -hmm. much. You sit with it, you sit with it yourself, Mm -hmm. and then you get an opportunity to respond or to be heard, but that it's separate. So it doesn't, I mean, talk about a tangled mess, right? It's like, We have one person's perspective and what they're going through. And I mean, just to speak to the trauma work or anything that's like so emotionally evocative, like your body is getting a workout. Mm -hmm. The physical sensations that we have to learn how to make space for and not be frightened of, which they're often very kind of intense, right? It is exhausting. But that boundary, I really wish that one of our norms would be, okay, let me hear it. Thank you for telling me, showing me inside you. Thank you for showing me your heart, even if I disagree with it, even if it's bringing up some defensiveness in me and handle that kind of separately. Mm-hmm. And and not to say that that person doesn't get airtime too, but wouldn't it be nice to take that airtime like even 24 hours later? Right, right. And I do plan, my, my son is coming down this weekend, so I will have a conversation with him and I will apologize because I think I had an unrealistic expectation and that's okay. We can have these little blips and stuff and it's it's really okay. So we need to wrap up, but I think I want to just before we end, I want to reiterate what the affirmations that I said to myself and what are the things that I've done along the way that have helped during this time. So getting support, I really felt blessed. You, Dara, I'm so afraid I'm going to forget someone. My friend Jean, my friend Laura. If I'm forgetting someone, I'm very sorry have really been so present for me and getting angry on my behalf. Because I think the other thing is that when we have trauma happen and we tell someone, they go, oh, then we think, oh, maybe we're making a big deal out of it. And when I wrote that text to send, I sent it to you. I had somebody else look at it. I sat with it for 24 hours because I wanted to make sure I wasn't being reactive. And the part of me that was feeling not very safe emotionally was that me just having being reactive or was there something that you could see in the text getting validation around that so when you have at least one person that you can pull into it the other thing is that every time i get intrusive thoughts i would surround melvin in white light because i don't want to have yucky energy and then i would propel him far out into the universe because i don't want that in my space and as i got ready to talk to people or knowing that i was going to be seeing him the thoughts changed and wanting to be prepared. Well, what if this happens? And what if that happens? And I really didn't want to spend a lot of my energy doing that. So when it happened again, I would surround him in light, shoot him out in the universe. And then today, what I find is I'm going over what was said and, you know, what do I think people think? And should I have said this? Should I have not? So there's a song by Karen Drucker who was on the podcast and it's, I'm healed, whole and healthy. And I just started to sing that to myself. It's like an earworm. Like I can either get focused on the wanting to rehash this, which is not going to make me feel good. It's over. It's done. I want to move on. The, I'm, I'm ready to do that. That's healthy for me. And so I need to do something to replace that when it comes in. So pick a song that you love, a phrase from a song. Sing that to yourself. Find a way to create comfort. And then I just had a little bit of time when I came home and I needed to shower and clean up. And I've been checking in with my younger part. You know, what does she need? What does she want to wear? What does she want to eat? Really being present for her. And then this morning, I imagined everybody in the group that I spoke with being giants. 
and Melvin being this little tiny thing. And then I brought in you and Dara and, you know, the people that I've been talking to and they were all very big and he was very small. And I think when we've been, when we're survivors of abuse, we feel very small, we feel very powerless. And so I used tools to really try and help myself feel empowered and to be really big. So on Saturday or Sunday, whenever this happened, I thought I wanted my husband to make me tuna and I didn't. And then I was taking a shower before we got ready. I thought I really want tuna. And so I said, would you make me some tuna? You know, that again, that feels like something that's really loving and nurturing. And so really tuning in and how can I be present for me and what do I need? I think as HSPs, we focus on, well, what if he says that? And like, in retrospect, I probably could have handled it differently with him. I didn't. And maybe there are ways that I could have approached him and I didn't. And I just have to be okay with that. And to keep the focus back on me, to not focus on the things that I could have said, should have said, maybe it would have gone better if I would have. It's like, under the circumstances, I did the best job that I could. It took me how many weeks to figure out that I've been in a trauma response for all of this time? How many tears have I shed? And to put the focus back on me, the goal was to use my voice, to speak my truth, to walk through the discomfort, to get the support and to heal that trauma and to know that a lot of the tears have been healing, to reframe that. Why am I crying? How come I'm so emotional? I really believe that I'm changing those patterns that are in my body to know that I have a right to be here and say what I need to. So there's a lot of active work that you need to do when you're working through your trauma because if at every step of the way I judge like, oh, I'm angry and I'm crying. Oh, I should have been more. If my focus is outward or judgmental, that doesn't support me in my healing. And I know that this is relatable to so many of you and and we need to be responsible for our own healing and keep that focus on us and use tools because it's easy to go into the rethinking, rehashing, and that's not gonna support me. That's not gonna help me. Thank you so much for sharing all of this with us. And I'm just listening to you talk and really feeling inspired. I love how you centered yourself, centered your narrative. And I'm just like watching this happen and thinking like if more of us learned how to do this and do this for each other, mm-hmm. you know, I mean, you're basically talking about being marginalized, right? Being mm-hmm. silenced and then being able to heal that, work through that, recenter, like at a very individual level. And I'm just so curious, like what could be done here more systemically, mm-hmm. you know, when it's like, whose voice is not being heard here and why are we not making space for multiple voices right why are we fighting over like the one and then the other thing that you said that really struck me was it, working with survivors of domestic violence and stuff is the sense of responsibility mm-hmm. that we have for other people's behavior mm-hmm. and their feelings and, and how, their reactions yep and how much that trips us up and it doesn't like let it lay bare <sighs> really what's going on. I mean, I'm happy to feel that you're safe, that you're supported. I know I think that was my word was the menacing. I mean, that did mm-hmm. that did frighten me a bit, right? And mm-hmm. I think getting this, exposing some of that menace, menacing the intimidation, the attempt to dominate, and this is the narrative. I mean, I just think that these things are really, really important. Mm-hmm. So thank you so much for sharing all of that. I, you know, I guess my little gremlin is I wish that at some point maybe I was, would have been able to help illuminate the trauma response, but we're all like in it, you know? Yeah. We're all in it because I know that you have, I don't know what the right word to use is, but been affected. Mm -hmm. I was going to say suffered, but these weeks have not been easy. Yeah. And so I'm glad you're reclaiming your power, Mm -hmm. (laughs) your space, your voice, and the authenticity. Like, you know, how often are we like, well, how should I respond? It's like, well, how did you respond? And and that's okay. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Did the best I could in the moment. And, you know, I I do have thoughts that I wish I would have said some other things when we met. And I didn't. And that's okay. And if I keep landing on that, I'm just going to redirect because it's over. It's done. I know what my truth is. So this is another place where it's easy to get into like, I want other people to know, well, Melvin omitted some things and I could have. And it's like, I know what my truth is. And so when this happens for you, I want you to recenter on, 
you know what your truth is. We do this thing with trauma where we over-explain, we add all kinds of unnecessary details because we're trying to prove and justify and we're not sure, you're not sure that what you're feeling and experiencing is valid, true, right, are you making too much out of it? And I want you to center back on, I know what's true for me. I know what's true for me. I did the best I can, it's over, I'm gonna move forward. I've been sleeping really well. (laughs) <laughs> which to me says I'm working through this. And if I did not have stuff around this, when I got that text on Sunday, I would have said, oh, he had a big reaction. It's not about me. Okay. But because I had so many feelings come up and this activated some of my trauma, what that said to me is I have healing I need to do around this. So it's no longer about Melvin. It's about what's coming up for me and how do I heal and how do I take care of myself, which is what we talked about today. But if you're having a big reaction or big feelings about things, that's about healing that you need to do. Even if somebody says or does something that's absolutely terrible. I mean, I'm thinking of like if terrible trauma happens and you're having a feeling, but I'm just saying we need to look at our part in it. And I'm starting to see situations where this doesn't apply and I just can't go there. So I'm going to trust that you will know the intention that I mean there. Yes. Yeah. 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 Is there anything else before we end, Jen? No, my dear. Just thank you. Thanks for sharing your process with us. Yeah, thanks for being here. You've been so supportive through this whole thing. I mean, I really think that it's the support and love that I've gotten from the people close to me that have allowed me to do this and to use my vulnerability and to ask for support and to get it. It's been incredibly, incredibly powerful. And I think that this is how one of the ways that we heal trauma and we don't have to do it alone. No, uh, no, absolutely. I'm not sure we can do it alone. Mm-mm. We can't. You yeah. can't. So, well, all right. Okay. Well, thank you. Yes. Thank you, my dear. Have a great day. Bye. You too. Bye. Hey again. So it all turned out okay. <laughs> If you see yourself in any of this, if you need support, please reach out to me at unapologeticallysensitive.com. You can see how loving and supportive and compassionate Jen has been. If you feel like you'd want to work with Jen, you can reach out to Jen at jen at heartfulnessconsulting.com. We would both love to support you, help you thrive as an HSP. Life is messy. This was messy. And I feel incredibly grateful and empowered. I I may dip down into having feelings about it, but really, I'm just so proud of how I handled this and how I walked through it. And and I want you to learn to recenter on yourself, to do your healing, get support. We can do hard things and we deserve to be here and to take up space and to have our voice. You deserve to have your voice. I hope you found this helpful. Remember. Sensitivity is nothing to apologize for. It's our superpower. Have a blessed day.